So your superego develops around age five and it's a way of navigating relationships. So if you're growing up in a childhood and your superego is trying to navigate an alcoholic parents, let's say, and they like, get angry and they attack you or they're inconsistent because they've drunk a lot. So you become hypersensitive to seeing any cues that the father or the mother might get angry. So that's your super ego developing, uh, trying to create a mask, create a persona to help make your family life, childhood family dynamics safer. You become hypersensitive to seeing any cues that the father or the mother might get angry. You become hypersensitive. Here's what codependency is in a nutshell. Let, let, me, let me say this loud and cloud so everybody gets it. It's a neurotic. So not neurotypical, not healthy, not boundaried. It's a neurotic drive. Drive, not choice, not lifestyle, not religious practice, not spiritual practice. We are driven. We have no choice. No choice, no freedom. You're slaves. I'm a slave. Codependency keeps us enslaved. So it's a neurotic drive to serve based on a terror of negative emotions. If you're not talking about this, you're not talking about codependency. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, but it's something else. This is codependency, ladies and gentlemen. It is a neurotic drive, no choice, no freedom to serve, to serve, to submit, to fawn, to supplicate. It is a terror of negative emotions in yourself and in others. Why do we feel so much pity for the narcissist? Why is it when my ex-husband is abusive, I just feel sorry for him? Why is it when my ex-wife talks to me that way, Instead of telling her to go and fuck off, I actually try and console her and make it better. Terror of negative emotions, like guilt. Guilt. How's that fall on people? Ugh. Ugh. Love it. So this neurotic drive to serve based on terror of negative emotion. And I'm going to try to link that the terror, one of the main terror is guilt. Guilt. And part of that is being you know, implanted. So let's say it's a developmental issue. So anyways, the two-year-old's a collection of these sort of random motivations, more or less gets his or her act together by about three, if they're being socialized properly. And that means that the parents are doing their best to make the child acceptable to other children. That's your damn job as a parent. You have to understand that. Because if your child isn't acceptable to other children, they won't play with your child. And then your child will be lonesome and isolated and awkward, and they will never recover. Because if the kid doesn't get that right between two and four, it's over. So between two and four, that's also a period your superego can develop and part of that is learning to make friends and interact in the social world they're never going to learn it the other kids accelerate forward that kid's left behind and it's not a good life for that kid they don't learn how to play with others and then they're done and there's a huge literature on trying to rectify antisocial children say from the age of four on it's like no you can't and you, you can go ahead and read three, four hundred pa papers on rectification of antisocial behavior and figure it out for yourself. But I did that for about five years and it was a while ago, but I know the literature hasn't changed. So part of the problem is psychology doesn't really address uh, codependence or people who have a messed up or virus infected superego. And it works sort of like an AI program. And once you've internalized them, you ha now have an inner parent that functions. For those of us without that, we're m missing a big chunk of software. So the computer doesn't run right because you probably don't have an internalized parent that says, you're good, so good things should happen to you. 
everything's okay. Everything's going to be okay. Don't do the shit thing. Do the thing that's good for you. Okay. Okay. Bye. That's what, that's what should be happening for a codependent. That shit isn't running. It's not there. So then we have to find ways of, I think the solution would be, how do we find ways of artificially installing that software so that we have a chance at some semblance of normality in the future? So this is the challenge or the unknown. I think the solution would be, how do we find ways of artificially installing that software so that we have a chance at some semblance of normality in the future? So we have to program our super ego or our moral center. That's sort of maybe the codependent, codependence core issue, trying to define it, define the problem, and then we'll explore whether there's any chances to address it. So our super ego is the parent voice in our head, whether it's good saying, this is what you want to do. Um, you're, you can make the right choice. You are strong and capable or bad as you suck and you can't do anything right. And why do you even bother? Uh, it's a seed of judgment. Guilt. Okay, quick overview. We're going to cover the path of metal and fire. Last week we covered water and fire. So metal and fire is combining uh, anger, passion with fear. And there's also judgment in here. So three emotions. And the idea is you develop character, you develop character and you develop dignity. And that's sort of your super ego suit is how to navigate the world, how to make friends, how to how to be a citizen in the world, how to, how to secure social connection, how to secure relationships and interact with people. The codependents developed that uh, fawn. Is that one of the four Fs? You develop a fawn superego, which is a fake self. Or you give more, you're people pleasing, and then you never develop a, a separate uh, entity. So. So does the narcissist develop a separate entity? The narcissist also has issues where they have a undeveloped or a lesser developed a developmental issue where their superego is also um, messed up. But let's define superego then. Okay, the Freud's model has three parts, id, ego, and superego. Simply put, you have the, the id is like the little devil on your shoulder. That's your childhood pleasure principle. Your superego is sort of the angel, your conscience, your more morality. And in between your ego is your reality principle. And then your ego and superego are conscience, conscious. And your id is mostly unconscious. You have these drives that communicate for the ego and then your ego can actualize it or not. So you could have something like this, simply put. You're a college student, you have your exams coming up. Your id might say, oh, have some alcohol. So don't do the work, go socialize, have some fun. Then your super ego might be the right thing to do is study hard and push through it and don't rest and relax. And then your ego would balance it too. And then you'd say, do or schedule it, but have a reasonable timetable so that you're not exhausting your body because your body is part of the, your id here wanted to socialize because it's exhausted. So the super ego might not be very compassionate to the, to your, to your id. So you have these two competing drives and the ego can sort of balance the two. But at the same time, ego has its own job. So the ego is reality principle. It is pleasure principle or survival, pleasure, survival impulses. And then the superego is uh, morality principle or judgment, sense of right and wrong. So these three principles, pleasure, reality, and morality principle. 
and morality principle is this the seat of guilt so if you have guilt issues your super ego is not uh, is not fully up to date with reality sort of how the dynamic is so we're going to throw a lot of stuff to see what sticks and then we'll try to find some some direction there are many systems you have many systems within let's say that guide you and what one of those is your capacity for rational thought and then you have a variety of emotional systems and motivational systems and internal dramas and uh, intuitions and bodily sensations like lots and lots of and senses lots of systems that are guiding you and many of them operate you might say unconsciously autonomously uh, instinctively implicitly all of that now you pr nonetheless you program them like you feed them content let's say just like you feed your body nourishment you feed them content and a lot of the content that you feed them pertains directly to your voluntary thoughts and speech and your actions and then if you pathologize those by lying so if you say things that you know not to be true or you don't say things that you know to be true when you need to which is more common and if you act in ways that you consider that in, act in ways you consider reprehensible then you pathologize all of those autonomous systems that guide you it's like you're programming them badly you're building an AI system inside yourself really and, and in some sense that is what you're doing that has very bad it's very bad training data and so the output it produces will be will won't guide you properly and so you don't want to pathologize your guidance systems it's a really bad idea so that's why you have to not lie and maybe that's also why you have to say what you have to say and you have to say it clearly as well and you have to learn how to do that so this part you're building an AI system inside yourself that has very bad it's very bad training data and so the output it produces will be well won't guide you properly won't guide you properly won't guide you properly if your super ego is your guidance system to survive social interactions or moral culture if that's still guiding you based on you being a five-year-old child with uh, narcissist grooming or alcoholic parent grooming if you don't update that programming then you fall into a narcissist borderline relationship because that feels normal because your AI system your id your morality picture principle this, this thing, your superego is still on at age five or eight or 12 or whatever. And there's different ways of framing it. So you could say you internalize your parent and you're trying to get love from your parent. So do you find a narcissist borderline, someone, a someone messed up and you can relive repetition compulsion to try to get love because your superego is a guidance system that's trying to find emotional connection i feel kind of silly i feel like that just went over my head like i you said it slowly and i was trying to listen to it can you mm -hmm. just say it one more time i feel like it probably really relates to me and i'm like blinded by it or something so I'm trying to get this. So your superego, Freud said, develops around age five. And it's a way of navigating relationships. Okay. So if you're growing up in a childhood and your superego is trying to navigate an alcoholic parents, let's say, and the alcoholic parents act out and they like, get angry and they attack you or they're inconsistent because they've drunk a lot. So you become hypersensitive to seeing any cues that the father or the mother might get angry. So that's your super ego developing, uh, trying to create a mask, create a persona to help su make your family life, your, your childhood family dynamics safer to navigate it. And then why do we seek out 
relationships the relationships with that's the part i got lost at if that that we're always searching for that or well you don't update your your super ego software it's what we're used to it's all you we know don't learn. we don't yeah. learn we're you not maturing update. You don't update okay. it to the real world. You still feel like a five-year-old. You've inverted the superego. The superego is supposed to help you navigate the real world, but you used it to navigate your family world, your family chaotic bullshit. And then you grew up as an adult and you still have uh, old software. So then Richard Grant and or then you run the rep repetition compulsion where you make find new relationships that have the same energy frequency of your childhood. And even Richard Grannon is still, still working with a uh, young woman of his mother's age. So when he came to visit us, he said he's still in repetition compulsion because his superego is driving him to the same patterns if you don't update your superego software. If, I mean, I'm trying to think of other terms uh, that don't involve, like, you know, um, perhaps some abuse. If your parents were inconsistent, whether, you know, let's say no, no substance abuse, they're just their parenting, that was, and that made me hypersensitive. Hypersensitive, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, here's a video example. It's a little long, but it gives a guy his example of how he developed a, a superego that was very sensitive to, to one scale of things. And it's positive and negative, but he hasn't broken out of the frame, but he describes it pretty good. So this might add some body. But my father had a particular trait in which I could say something one day, like for example, he was playing ping pong. I was four years old, three, four years old. He was playing ping pong. He took a stroke hit off the top of his paddle and just shot across the room. He was going for like a forehand smash, shot across the room way, like hit the corner of the wall. And I was just passing through and I go home run and kept walking. Two days later, he corners me, throws me down in the corner of the room and says, how dare you humiliate me in front of my competition? I can't believe you said that it threw me off my game. That was, hmm. you know, like you blah, blah, blah. And I was like, holy shit. Mm -hmm, I had yeah. forgotten about even saying that i'd forgotten mm. about how that could have possibly been perceived and i'm this mm. little kid and it's my, actually a pretty good joke yeah i mean right? you know for a four-year-old yeah, yeah it wasn't bad <laughs> yeah it wasn't good bad enough, yeah. home run i don't yeah. know yeah. made sense to me yeah and so anyways that and and that would happen repeatedly where it wouldn't even be immediate it would mm. be like delayed like he would it would fester yeah and it yeah grew interesting. And, and so we would come at that me means later you're touching on a complex yes yeah, for yeah. sure for something sure. was under he's, there causing there all sorts of trouble all sorts of trouble and mm -hmm. he was he worked you know to my dad's credit he he knew he had issues and he worked very hard on those he mm -hmm. just couldn't get himself completely out of the maze mm -hmm. oh yeah it, it, when someone does that to you a few times you know there's something in there that needs to be fought through for deep. like about a month deep. like horrible month deep and yeah. he fought and he and he fought hard but the the effect of that gave me this intense judge of everything i said so i did i fractured myself into two parts so that intense judge is super ego developing and one of the dangers was the father would get upset about something he said and it'd come back two days later it wouldn't be right after he said it he'd had to he'd pay the consequences later I have this watcher of everything. How could this be perceived? And then it splinters into a million different possibilities. Could this be perceived as an insult? Could this mm -hmm. be perceived as a slight? Is this joke like this? Which in some regards has made me a very effective communicator. And it's almost one of my superpowers. Mm -hmm. So that moment of trauma created this superpower of really being able to understand how my words can be communicated. Mm -hmm. But, so did and did that make you more careful with your words? A thousand percent. Uh -huh. so hyper careful. Mm -hmm. Hyper careful with mm -hmm. my words. But it also created this watcher that is always watching and always judging what I do, mm -hmm. which is a sense, a source of suffering because I, mm -hmm. I felt like it's very difficult for me to get fully engaged in anything. Cause I'm always re keeping some part of me that's judging everything that I'm saying. So this fracture of self is a sort of sense of suffering. Are, well, are there, are, he calls it a 
fracture of self, but using Freud's model, that's just his superego. That's hypersensitive. And for him, it's hypersensitive to how his language or what he says is going to be interpreted. And it's allowed him this superpower of very nuanced, perfected, a verbal acu acuity, but it has this constant inner critic energy that's constantly judging him, giving him noise. That's the catch 22. Mm -hmm. Question for you. Um, so I've got siblings and my siblings are not codependent, just me. Okay. Um, we have the same parents. Uh, what caught, I'm the oldest, but what, I mean, I'm just wondering if anybody else had that, um, or has that situation or thought about that? Like why, I just feel like I'm ultra sensitive. Often um, families will have a, one person as ends up being a scapegoat. So is that the codependent? Might be the person who's the most sensitive or the most, uh, who ends okay. up being the most sensitive. It's like musical okay. chairs. Someone needs to be blamed. You ended up being that one. So the rest of the people in the family, they didn't, they didn't have to be as sensitive. Let me guess, they tell you you're crazy, you're oversensitive, you're dramatic, and they're fine. Yeah, you're being gaslit, fuck them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Stacey, I love you. I love you, just get Cause down it's to bullshit. the bullshit. Cause it's complete bullshit. They're always, now, see, don't you? Sorry. Right now, Stacy's super ego is triggered because mm -hmm. it's making a judgment against the people who aren't even here. That's okay. Which is okay because it. the superego is just an AI program. And I know I'm right. So, and the, when you're talking from superego, you just have this sense of righteousness because it's pure judgment. Mm -hmm. That's why the I'm super judging ego- judging my family used, and I don't even know them. Yeah, the, but the superego gives you this fast sword cutting, clearing everything this is right, this is absolutely right, and you just go full force. And that's where it's useful. But we want to update it to our adult world. That's the updating the AI program. That's the tricky part. So does that need to be updated? Because we all know that the person that speaks up is the one that's the scapegoat is usually the one that sees through the bullshit. Well, as a child, if you're scapegoated, then you learn to self-silence because right. you didn't have the, the space or voice to be able to articulate and take a stand. So now as an adult, you have the same problem. Right, Carol? Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. But, but a weird way is I actually felt good about being that person. Like I was caring Carol, you know, I was, Oh, I can fix everything. I will help you. I will like give of myself. I like, I took pride in that I, and still do like, I'm, I'm working on not doing that and taking care of me anyways. Um, yeah. So that's the inverted morality, which is, it's not that complicated, but it's hard to describe. So here's a transactional analysis model, TA model, where they have parent, adult, and child. So your super ego ends up being the parent for your, your, your parent's child, inner child. So you end up soothing their emotions to make your world safe. And then Carol, you mentioned you ended up being so good at being a rescuer, people pleaser, whatever, that you saw that as moral high ground. When you start seeing it as moral high ground, now you're programming your superego. In the wrong way. Uh, no, it worked as a child. It's not wrong or right. It's just not updated for your current life. That's the problem. Or that's my argument. So it helped you survive or helped me survive maybe as a child and a teen or. Yeah. And now, okay. It helped you survive and you, it ended up becoming your identity. You're being a nurturing parent to everybody, even if they don't want it. 
or you see people's inner child cry and you jump in before there's any relationship. Yeah. Because the superego is just autopilot. It's very fast. It's very quick. It has a sense of right and wrong. And then if there sees a problem, it just goes. It's so it's not, it, it's good because it's autopilot, but it's, but it's bad when it's using bad data. So let's do this model to sort of see. This is sort of abstract, but we'll see. So the superego is your morality principle. And it's the seat of judgment. That's why you feel guilt a lot. So if you're in, if your superego is in supercharged and you haven't figured out how to navigate society to get connection, your superego is going to be on overdrive to try to secure connection and belonging, especially in our current Western society. But the way you secured uh, connection and belonging as a child was to pacify the angry baby of your parents and take care of the pitiful, sad babies of your parents and other siblings. That's uh, the reverse parenting. You start parenting your, the id of your, your parents. Because if you pacify the angry baby of your parent, then the angry baby doesn't beat the shit out of you. Well, the yeah. ego isn't just the manager. The ego is the reality principle. Mm. So the ego is sorting out what's real. That's if the ego is doing its job well. That's why it's important not to not to lie to yourself and not mm. to lie to your your super ego. Is the ego is in charge of sorting out what's real and fake, and feeding that data to both the id, the inner baby, and also feeding that data to the super ego. Codependence like um, steps. <laughs> so here's uh, stages of morality. So you can use your superego and judge yourself. That's the downside of this, this model, but maybe it could add some framing. So using this as a developmental chart, there's three levels or six stages broken up into three levels of morality. And most people only reach stage four at most. Anything past five and six is, you know, you have to cultivate virtue. So stage one is when you focus on just avoiding punishment. So this might be a narcissist is between stage one and two. So their level of morality is, can I get away with it? And is it good for me? So they get good at blaming uh, other people. So that's Trump. So their, their morality is, I don't want to, I don't want to get caught. And then you can go upgrade and say, oh, is it good for me? So that's a little higher morality. Then you can go to stage three, which is sort of maybe codependent. So that's people pleasing. Am I a good boy? Am I a good girl? And then stage four is now you learn the rules of the world, law and order, and you try to do what's right based on what society says, your culture says, what is right and wrong. Then you start getting higher, and this is the path, this is where you're, if you can, or this is a hard sell. So if you can update your superego programming, your morality to higher level stage five and six, then you aren't gonna be affected by uh, narcissists and borderline attacks. Because your morality and your superego doesn't have any holes anymore. You're now serving a higher purpose, you're serving a higher purpose of society contract. What's best for society, not what's best for me. 
that's what's best for the person who's the most angriest. What's best for the collective? What's best for society? What's the biggest aim that's good for me and good for society? That's your morality. And then you live by universal principles if you want to up your game a little higher. So now I'm serving God. So society might be saying this is right and wrong, but society is wrong here. So like Martin Luther King or Gandhi, they stood up against the government because in their heart, from their higher morality, they were fighting for principles that even meant their own going against law and order. So then your structure of the world is much more solid because if you're living in principles or you're living at higher levels of morality, then the narcissist can't guilt trip you so easily because you have a stable foundation in the world. Is this similar to where we were going back and forth about like how the narcissist is always making the most noise and therefore their needs are the first one to be addressed. And because it feels like it's so immediate, we feel like we have to attend ourselves to their needs in order to avoid whatever punishment they may have. Well, if you're worried but, about avoiding their punishment, mm -hmm. so that's also you being at stage one or two. Mm -hmm. so self-preservation. Yeah, if you're in self-preservation, your morality structure, your super ego structure isn't developed enough. It's sort of inverted. That's the re that's a problem of today's presentation. People's super ego is inverted. Your super ego is supposed to help you navigate the real world, make your world bigger and bigger and bigger as you get older. You can now become more a social citizen, uh, a world citizen, a world active in the game of the world. But your super ego was inverted, where it was just trying to pacify your parents and everybody else around you, their id, their impulses. And, and that doesn't work in the real world. Wait, this also goes back to the whole, um, how we have this social system where we keep trying to refer to what the law says and therefore we keep trying to find an adult to take care of the narcissist, which is why we keep asking for like, Training war against uh, you know emotional abuse, but there isn't one because it's not something any other adult can really deal with. Something to that effect, right? So you cry for you cry for police because the narcissist hurt your feelings or uh, isn't following moral rules or something like that, right? Yeah. So that's where your super ego still feels like a kid. It doesn't know how to. It doesn't know how to dis distinguish right and wrong or to exert punishment. Uh, sort of like here. So here's two things. So we want that, like from me to you, I think that you should be able to say, as a man, as a human being, you have a right to be in the world. And if anybody fucks with that, you hit them. Now it might be physically, or it might be psychologically, or it might be a no, or you might cut them out of your life, but you stand up for yourself. That's what your parents are supposed to say. If your parents are, if you're getting bullied at school and you go home and say, this big kid is punching me, they're supposed to tell you to defend yourself. So if you grew up with more healthy parents, they would help you or encourage you to defend yourself or that you have a right to exist as a person separate. But then you, if as a codependent, you might try the fawn technique, which this is talking about. Here's a little tip for you. Um, you don't have to smile at people. You don't have to smile at people. It's not your job to make other people feel comfortable. Stop smiling so much. I see people at seminars and they tell me that they're being bullied at work and they're like this, they're with their eyes wide. <laughs> I'm like, Stop nodding and smiling all the fucking time. You look like somebody who's going to get bullied. Stop nodding, stop smiling, and stop doing this with your eyes. That you see this? This is a human expression that's there to, to indicate lack of threat, lack of arrogance. 
it's not my job to, to present myself as a lack of threat to you. If you if you see me as a threat, I don't need to be like, oh, I have no weapons. Oh, just look, no weapons, no threat. Mm. I don't have to fucking do that shit. That's your problem. If you're paranoid or you're weak or you're cowardly and you're threatened by me, that's your problem. Now, when I look at people, I do this. We go, oh, you have a resting bitch face. I don't know what's. It's the face God gave me. I'm not performing for you. If you want to know me, you can start speaking to me. But you'll be polite and you'll be boundaried. I don't, I, I'm never rude to people. I'm very, very non-confrontational with people. But I won't offer them my time and my attention. I'll quite happily walk away. I'll quite happily just get up and leave. In fact... I don't think I've had a verbal confrontation with somebody in the last few years uh, who was imposing some stupid conversation on me. I just leave and they know. They know perfectly well that I just wasn't having it anymore. So don't, um, with uh, narcissistically abusive relationships, for example, that form a dyad, that requires two people. And the codependent phone responder leans in don't lean in. Don't please. Placebo, the placebo effect means I will please. You're nocebo. You do not please. I'm not here to please you. I'm so, Well, you find me threatening. Well, okay, maybe that's something you need to see a counselor about. Maybe, maybe you're thin-skinned. Maybe you're insecure. But that's not my problem to make you feel comfortable. I've wasted a lot of my life um, and a lot of my energy fighting to make people feel comfortable because I know that they saw me as a threat. That's their problem, not mine. That's their problem, not mine. That's their problem, not mine. How's that fall? I love it. Love it. What part? How oh, so? why? Are you able to apply it? Just because you love it doesn't mean that... I can apply it. it. Leave me alone. Or else. I love it. So that's learning how to stand up for yourself. Absolutely. So we got to update the AI software. That's sort of the groundwork I'm trying to lay. Your super ego is undeveloped or it's developed to try to counter and pacify. It's terrified of the angry baby is terrified of the parents id, let's say. And it's also terrified of angry baby that is also sad because when you have a tantrum, anger and sadness both get kicked in. And then your world falls apart. The parents triggers your tantrum and everyone's just dysregulating and emotional flashbacks. So your super ego is trying to navigate angry babies. So anger ends up being judged as bad. Everyone, we want to make everyone a pacifist, unicorn loving utopia. So if we can update your super ego to navigate the real world, turn that into an AI program, then you can have your super ego helping you out. So how many people have issues with inner critic that's too noisy? And what's your strategy for the inner critic? How many people say like, shut up to their inner critic? They just try to run it over. I know. Shut the fuck up is more like it. <laughs> oh, see, that's more honest. See? So you could learn to have, there's an argument to just say you can have a conversation with your uh, inner critic. So this is one style. And then Granin has his version too. That judge that you have internally, which is, let's call it the voice of conscience, it suffers from a certain generic quality, you know? So it, it's, it's judging you in a cliched manner. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's wrong, but it's cliched. It's not fully informed. And so what you want to do throughout your life is have a dialogue with that because it needs to learn just like what it's judging needs to learn. And maybe if that dialogue... You know, it's, it's not that much different than having a relationship, like a long-term relationship, like a marriage, because 
you're continually communicating with any lock and you're modifying each other in the communication. Yeah. And you have that judge, which you need because it makes you alert and makes you watchful sure. and makes you consider your actions. But it isn't God, that, that internal voice. It doesn't know everything. So it needs to learn too. And so I think it's reasonable to engage it in dialogue and to find out and not to make the instantaneous assumption that just because the judge says that what you're doing is wrong, that it's absolutely correct in its judgment. Mm -hmm. You want to fight back and say, no, I, I, I'm going to defend myself against that internal voice. No, and I'm not going to listen to it because it might be right. It might be right. You want to listen, but it needs to learn too. And so you can get that dialogue going. And then I think that you can get that union across yeah. time. So you can dialogue with your uh, super ego, with your inner critic. Is that worth considering? Is there like a checklist or a, like a list of questions? Cause I'm like, how do you do that? Could you be more specific? Well, that's what I'm asking you. <laughs> I know you're asking for more specifics, but yeah. What's, yeah. What seems well, so challenging? And, I sit there and smile. I'm the one that sits there and smiles and just, like hopes it all goes away and maybe if I'm smiling enough or my eyes are open or I'm looking you in the eye and give you know and I I'm not one that maybe would talk well I talk a lot but when there's a bad situation I'm very quiet and um you know I don't know maybe I talk too much to myself but but I'm not asking the right questions that's what I'm trying to do what what are the proper to change what are the right what should I be focusing on or where should I go? What direction? How do I, how do I change? I would s simply say that your ego, the conscious part of you is the uh, reality sorter. So you want to make sense of reality and you also want to make sense of what's going on with your super ego and id, your unconscious parts. Now you lost me because obviously I've been, I'm an adult. I've been telling myself the same thing for many, many, many years. Cause I'm still acting the same way. And I'm, I need, I need guidance. I need help on how to break that and how to, how to be different, how to act different, how to tell well, myself different things to change. Is part of it just reparenting yourself in the way that you would have wanted to be parented where you say when that inner critic comes in and says, you fuck that up, you are so worthless. You say, no, I'm not. I did the best job that I could and, and that's good enough for now. And then just leave it at that and keep, keep when it comes back, just getting it with that more accepting attitude. And then eventually, I think, at least for me, it's it, it quieted so much that I don't really hear it anymore. So you believe yourself when you tell yourself that? Initially, I didn't. Um, but eventually, I came around to believing it. So, yeah, part of it was, you know, fake it till you make it sort of thing. But, um, but I also thought about, well, I did do the best I could with the information I had at that time. And it sounded like a cop out to me, but at the same time, when I stepped through it to understand what it was that I did, I realized that it was true in, in you know, specific cases or whatever. So that's a common, or that's what Granin teaches too, and it's a common technique to try to switch your inner dialogue to affirmations, to have a nurturing parent. So I'm trying I'm, to oh. add a different frame. Stacy, yes. Yeah, I just, it's just making me think like, so like when I was going through my divorce and the therapist had actually said, I think it's really important that you're impeccable with your speech. And, and he, he like got me to like reframe it. Like, is this true? Did you leave just because of this? Or did you leave because, you know, your needs weren't met, you weren't happy, you are this, that. And so it, it kind of, like, it, that inner critic was coming down on me pretty hard. But then the reality was, like, that wasn't true. It was, it was just this story to make myself feel bad about leaving. Is this, is this kind of what you're talking about? That principle of be impeccable with your speech is a... You're planting 
in your morality a suggestion that morality can use, your superego can use. Right. So then that could cut through the cut through the, all the noise. Right. So then it made sense. So you're using your ego and your superego together. Right, which is what you really want to do. So to, to get that story out of your head with the guilt and the... Well, no, it know, gets the story out of your head because you're giving your, your superego, your morality, a higher purpose. Got it. Perfect. This that is really nuance. Resonates. You want to give your superego language of morality, of a higher morality, and then it'll sort through the noise. Yeah, that really, really makes sense. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the tricky part. So this is your superego, let's say, is your goal-seeking mechanism. If you feed your superego with goals and you help track the goals so that it's discipline, but gradual baby steps, then now you're directing your superego towards the future towards some future, towards some aim. And the superego can, can use that. That's what it wants. It wants an aim. It wants a vision. It wants a principle. Like be impeccable with your speech. That's also it's like be honest, be impeccable, figure out what's really true. That ideal, the superego can, can process. Instead of trying to run over your superego or run over your inner critic, you just need to feed it more uh, noble aims, higher morality, higher truths, instead of just safety or utopia, because utopia is too big of an aim. Everyone should just love everybody. You can make that judgment, but the superego, what does it do with it? Is there like a book that can guide us with some kind of thread on how to start some, you know, like that discipline of nurturing or, or like. Yes. So I'll, I'll offer things in the comments, but it's not really, you don't communicate to your superego through like 10 steps. You communicate to your superego through principles. So this is one of the more recent good books on principles by Ray Dalio. Yeah, I feel like maybe, you know, when you're there, when, when like, let's say the whole world tells you that you're wrong about something, but you can sit in the knowledge that you are right in your choices and actions. You, yeah, if you're, the whole world is against you and you're holding strong into your morals. It's like, it's like having, I think, some sort of internal compass to, to guide you because I, and being comfortable and resting in the surety of your decisions. So how would somebody who's a codependent who doesn't have that, how, do, how would they develop that? I feel, honestly, I think it's through a lot of pain and it's through pain and it's through, through doubting yourself and watching the consequences of what happens when you doubt yourself and then realizing at the end you were right all along. I think it comes from repeated experiences like that to begin to start trusting yourself again. So part of that is through doubt. And that was the theme that Stacy mentioned with be impeccable for speech. And that's partially what uh, Richard Grannon uses. So you have to plant doubt into the old uh, beliefs you had to explore a bit more, to figure out what, what's really meaningful to you and what's really happening in the world. You've developed a relationship with your superego. That's a harder pitch. And then you feed it or you get curious to figure out what's important to you, what matters to you. And then you feed it direction on goals of life. So Jordan Peterson frames it as having a noble aim. It turns out that the way that we're constructed neurophysiologically is that we don't experience any positive emotion unless we have an aim and we can see ourselves progressing towards that aim. It isn't precisely attaining the aim that makes us happy. As you all know, if you've ever attained anything, because as soon as you attain it, then the whole little game ends. 
then you have to come up with another game, right? So it's, it's Sisyphus, and that, that's okay, but, but it does show that the attainment can't be the thing that drives you because it collapses the game. That's what happens when you graduate from university. It's like you're king of the mountain for one day, and then you're like surf at, 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 at Starbucks for the next five years, you know? So, yeah. So what happens is that, that human beings are weird creatures because we're much more activated by having an aim and moving towards it than we are by attainment. And what that means is you have to have an aim. And that means you have to have an interpretation. And it also means that the nobler the aim, that's one way of thinking about it, the better your life. And that's a really interesting thing to know because, you know, you've heard ever since you were tiny that you should act like a good person and you shouldn't lie, for example. And you might think, well, why the hell should I act like a good person and why not lie? I mean, even a three-year-old can ask that question because smart, smart kids learn to lie earlier, by the way. And they, they think, well, why not twist the fabric of reality so that it serves your specific short-term needs? I mean, that's a great question. Why not do that? Why act morally? If you can get away with something and it, it brings you closer to something you want, well, why not do it? These are good questions. It's not self-evident. Part of that is sitting with the questions. If you sit with the questions, what's important, why do this, why be honest, then your conscience, your intuition will give you answers. So it's having a conversation with yourself, observing yourself, and giving it, building trust, and also giving your superego a direction, a forward focused direction that can, has progress, not some fantasy that is way out there that you can't progress towards, something that you can track as a goal that you can grow towards through discipline. And then now you start feeling good because you feel you're, uh, you have some self-efficacy, you have some mastery. Do people that are not codependents do this normally and we're just missing it? Is this? Possibly. Are they head towards it normally? We do have a lack of role models in our society and, and mentors. So we don't have as many models of people living this example. But someone who has a more normal upbringing than their super ego or their morality principle better adjusts to the real world. That's the, the tricky part of codependence is you have this inverted or this undeveloped morality. That's my argument. That makes it difficult to jump into the real world. Angry baby concept makes a lot of sense to me. Growing up in a not so functional family, I guess, and being afraid of like my father yelling at me, right? So I establish this fear of people yell at me. So then I avoid people yelling at me. And then I go into a relationship with someone who either, either yells at me or is aggressive towards me. And that's kind of intimidating because I still have this memory from when I was a, a child. But then if you can get to a point where you reframe it because you don't want to live that way. I don't want to live that way my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, then if, if I can get to a point where I can reframe it and say, well, okay, I know I felt that way when I was a kid, but now do I have to feel that way? Like I'm a grown up, right? It's not exactly the same. It's not my parent bearing over me that, you know, feeds me that, um, you know, is responsible for me having shelter and clothing in the world. And I'm, you know, I, I have a, some agency and I don't necessarily have to react the same way I reacted when I was a child. Um, so I think it's helpful kind of to see that, um, how that is relevant to my life and how I'm trying to move myself away from the way I responded in the past more healthily now. So in the past you had angry baby or the parents angry baby was danger to you because then right. when you're a child, that was true. So now as an adult, somebody having rages triggers the emotional flashback or the memory of your childhood. Right. And you have to sort of unpack that with doubt and curiosity and exposure. Yeah. 
that's the tricky part. But once you disconnect from that, um, or once you update the software, right? Then you could give your you give your morality, you give your super ego a bigger task, a more noble aim. Instead of the old aim of saying, I want to make sure no one gets angry around me, so I'm safe. You have an aim that's bigger than your safety, bigger than your id, bigger than your survival instincts. It's sort of counterintuitive. You want to, it seems like you want to have an aim that's easier or five steps so that you know you can guarantee the end. But you need an aim that actually, actually you don't know how you're going to get there or you sort of have an idea, but you need a little help. And that's what your, your, your morality brain wants something that's just a little beyond your ego. Then it'll be, then it has food. You're feeding it something challenging. Otherwise it's gonna try to create utopia from your childhood, the same, because that was also trying to reach for something that's impossible. Trying to create utopia in your childhood, that was a goal that morale, your superego, your morality wanted. Wanted something that was super challenging, something that was beyond your, cap your capability. So if you give it something else, then it won't, then it has something productive, then you can now have positive feelings like, going, oh, now I'm, now I'm, now life matters. Now I'm making progress towards this new goal, this new noble aim. Because we spend an inordinate amount of energy trying to silence our inner critic or ignoring the inner critic, right? Uh, if you spend some time collaborating with it, maybe being more parallel to it, you can start slowly update your superego program. And then now you can slowly give it a better aim. A better aim is going to now be attractive to, this, to the superego to your moral compass, your GPS system. And it'll be more interested in pursuing a new goal because the old goal of repetition compulsion is inherently meaningless because you've been failing again and, and again and again. That's interesting because you can't really change a habit. You can replace it, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe, yeah, you're trying to replace the habit or you're trying to re replace the goal establish a new habit which mm -hmm. then can make you forget about the old one um yeah you forget about the old one or the new habit is more meaningful so right. then naturally you'll be more drawn to the more meaningful new habit but if you don't consciously do that your ai program is still running like you're 10 years old it's the same program there's no update it doesn't it doesn't your morality principle doesn't have a link to reality. Your ego does, but your morality principle is just like one track minded, single track, continue. It just keeps going on and on on autopilot. Is there a way that you can block your brain from either reliving things or repeating it? Because I... I... Keep going. What's the challenge when you relive things or? Because um, I don't, I, I keep reliving it the same way. I don't, I don't move forward. I, and. Okay. So there's two parts that you can address it with. You can address it with your, with your morality principle, which is going to say, this is bad and I want to stop it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of use your, you can sort of use your morality to stop your thoughts. Maybe that's what people do. But you can use your ego, your curiosity, to insert doubt, to sort of uh, pull apart the threads of those memories. So it's a little abstract, but this is how Richard Grannon does it. So, and then we'll see if this falls, but it's, it's an unpacking strategy. He calls it Socratic questioning. questioning. What I found useful um, was, uh, um, so this is, this is me adding on uh, my bit now. 
um, was as I was going through this process, was kind of like a, a, a dialectic, a Socratic interaction where, where, where I would uh, say, ah, oh, that's interesting. Um, so apparently I'm a worthless, a worthless piece of shit. And the inner critic goes, yeah, you're a maggot. And I go, ah, that's, have I, have I always been worthless? Yeah. Oh, so I've, I've never, never, I've never done anything good. Never done anything good. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I could feel it shrink, not disappear, but shrink, like the certainty goes. And I would say, well, you know, you're part of me. How, how is this useful? What do you think the inner critic said to that? When I turn around and, I'm, and, I, get, and, I, and I get my little philosophical hat on, and I say, how is it useful to tell me 24-7 that I'm a worthless piece of shit? What, what's, what's the end goal here? Just, just clue me in so we're all on side because you're a part of me. How is it useful to only ever have one message for me? What do you think the inner critic said? It said nothing because it can't answer that question because it's not, it's not even artificial intelligence. It's a recording. So it'd be like me saying to a tape recorder, why do you play that same song over and over again? It doesn't have an answer for me. It doesn't speak. It can only deliver one message repetitively. And when I realized that, and I started using that Socratic method of, of, of questioning, of being like, ah, okay, that's an interesting point of view you have. Where do you derive, what's the evidence for that? And where does that come from? At a certain point in that line of questioning, it would just, it would, sometimes it would stop, but you could feel a hesitancy and a shrinking of the force. And it, it would kind of just get quieter. You're, you're, still, a, you're still a piece of shit. Still, but it's over on the other side of it. You still suck. You're still a maggot. I was like, well, no, come back. I'm ready to hear you. But what are you saying? What are you? What? What? What's your fundamental communication? And what is the agenda here? And that really helped because I was pointing out to this part of me: you only ever say one thing, and that can't be true all the time because nothing is. That's dogma. Nothing is always true. Not, nothing is always true. There's, there isn't a person alive who's purely just a useless, worthless maggot. They must have done one thing. So I'd be like, well, tell me the one thing I've done that's good. Nothing ever. I'm like, that, come on, you know, and I know that that can't be right. So there's, there's that methodology as well that I applied to it that I found, I found useful as well. So that's another style of having a conversation with your memories or your inner voices. And they're just repeating back and being curious and trying and putting it on the spot. What's, what, how can I change here? What, what can I do? What exactly am I always a maggot? Whatever, it depends on what your inner voice is saying. Does that give you more ideas, Carol? Yeah. I just, I guess I was wondering if other people in the group experience that also. I, I don't hear, there's a lot of people in this meeting and I don't hear stuff from other people and I feel like uh, that would be very flashbacks. valuable. Does anyone else have issues with emotional flashbacks or uh, repeating yes. inner critics? Yes, absolutely. Yes, all the time. Yes, of course. Right, you have your inner critic, and then you have your parents telling you, you know, the same thing. I mean, that obviously puts us in a position where we become codependents and are ripe for the narcissist abuse. You know, you've got everybody saying you're a piece of shit. Why wouldn't you be? And if you don't know any better to tell your inner critic, stop it, you know, you'll just believe it. And then you're ripe for the pickings, I guess. There's an observation that uh, Jordan Peterson uses that um, a lot of psychotherapy uses that we're nicer to our friends than we are to ourselves. It's true. Have we heard, have we heard our friends talking to themselves the way we talk to ourselves sometimes or yeah. you know, beat, beat up themselves the way we beat up ourselves. We're like, don't, why are you doing that to yourself? Don't do that. So I think that's part of our morality is gone overdrive. It's seeing ghosts or you're still fighting ghosts. But the morality 
your morality brain is blind to reality. It's blind to time and space. It needs to be updated. Yeah. But if you just tell it, shut the fuck up, it's not, you're not telling any update. So if you have a conversation, figure out how to have a conversation, ask some questions with it. Then you're developing trust. So yeah, let's say you have your, your inner critic and you've been yelling at it for 10 years. Every time it says shit about you, talk shit, you ignore it or you yell at it, right? Shut the fuck up. How much trust is built in that relationship? So it's gonna take some time just letting it talk and asking questions to develop trust. Once trust is developed, then now you can update your inner critic. Like, oh, I'm now grown up. I'm now 40, I'm 50, I'm 30. I'm not a five-year-old anymore. These are <laughs> values important to me now. Just update the software. So that's pretty much what I've been working on all start of 2020, even before the pandemic and everything. Mm -hmm. My voice, my inner critic was definitely like very loud and very critical. Uh, it, it takes a lot of just be like, okay, you are still in my head. So there's a reason you're in my head. Are you trying to protect me from something? Because right now you're hurting me more than you're helping me. It's constantly hearing the same notion that like, all right, I'm trash, I'm terrible, I'm, I'm going to die alone, I'm, you know, a monster. All right, cool. But like, is that helping me survive? Like, is this really like improving my situation in any way, shape or form? Or is it literally just like on repeat? Something that I used to believe is true because I thought it was like the only thing to be true. But updating that just takes practice and a lot of like analysis, so to speak. I like one of the questions or the framing of the question is saying, where is this going? Is this helping? How are you trying to help? These are sort of morality-based goal-seeking questions. Because that's why you have these programs, their survival mechanisms to navigate uh, social danger. So if you ask questions along the lines of, how is this successful? What's the aim here? What's the goal? then that connects to the moral. Your moral principle is trying to navigate, help you navigate the world. And then, that, then there's an opening to update the information. That voice has been going on for a long time. I just didn't see it. Mm -hmm. um, so at least what I've come up with for right now, what works for me is... Um, identifying one thought that keeps looping at a time because yeah um, I believe a lot of us have like at least four or five like constant inner critics that keeps coming up like I'm a bad whatever you know I procrastinate I'm this I'm that so just holding one thing at a time and seeing what it is trying to tell me what's the message that it's trying to bring forth and then maybe naming it something or befriending it instead of pushing it away or maybe looking at it um, as a child, you know, like I just try to visualize my niece or my nephew because, you know, they're little kids and I'm like, if they run to me saying, here's what's going on, I'm not going to push them away. I'm going to listen to what they have to say because clearly that part of me is hurting. It's in pain. It wants attention. So when I shine that spotlight on it, it seems like the answers start to emerge. Of course, it's painful when you look at it. It's like, why, why and try to fight it and wrestle it to the ground? But it's like, you know, the other option is just being gentle and sitting with it. It's like, okay, fine, you know, like, let's deal with this. So um, I guess the two things that would, you know, be really helpful is the inner child work and um, reprogramming the subconscious mind to see what the root cause of, um, that critical thinking is or where it's coming from and shifting it. Like the first step is identifying it and then rewriting that story, basically that programming. So that has been helpful for me. That's good, yeah.
So finding the root cause, and a lot of these programs, if they're written when you're a child, they don't have that. They don't have a well thought out, articulate language. It's just an urgency. So you have to be patient with this inner voice or these parts to, to let it talk out more so you can figure out what the root cause is. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you just figure out the root cause, then you can say that danger doesn't exist anymore. So there's not even anything to do. Or there's something minimal to do because that program's still operating based in a younger time frame or a different time zone. You describe that really well. Too easy. The ultimate thing is still being honest with yourself. So this is sort of to give the bigger frame. So if you're honest with yourself and you're curious, then slowly all your programming gets up to date and life gets easier. But uh, you take the shortcut of shutting things down and not, or giving white lies that keeps appearances going, but it doesn't help everything long-term. It's a short-term strategy. If there is going to be one thing, I'm going to cheat and say it's a very broad thing. And that would be, you do need quite a high degree of self-awareness and you need to have a philosophical commitment to being honest with yourself, which if everybody in this world took it upon themselves, the world would change overnight. If we just stop lying to ourselves, we can still lie to each other. That's fine. We're still allowed to lie to each other. But if we stop lying to ourselves, everything would change instantly. And so after an interaction or I get off the bus and I'd be like, well, you didn't say goodbye to the driver. And one part of my brain goes, oh, I don't need to. And he's busy. And the other part of my brain says, oh, because you're scared. You're scared to say goodbye to the driver. So then I would pull myself up on it and go, okay, are you going to stay in the comfort zone or are you going to become visible? And I'm still struggling with that to this day. I still am working on that. Overcoming narcissistic abuse, not a problem. Overcoming CPTSD, completely doable. Overcoming codependence is is hard, very, very tough. I think we lie to ourselves because sometimes it's too much to really process on an adult, adult level. Like if somebody can be that mean and that nasty, and yet mm-hmm. we are thinking that we're not lovable, but we are. And so we protect ourselves and either smile or um, don't, certainly don't tell other people what's going on, but we don't even tell ourselves just because it's too hurtful or too painful to deal with. Like we don't have this, I don't, do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, I'd say, well, it's easy to lie to yourself. It's easier sometimes, but for protection. Well, you, you grew up and you learned that lying or saying a white lie kept things safer. Yeah. So that program just kept going. Yeah. And to make an argument to say that now living in truth is a higher good that has to be um, sold. It has to be presented, considered. You need to develop trust with your all your parts. And then long-term, it's beneficial. Beneficial. Short-term, there might be cost, yes. Yeah. But it's not the same cost of you as a child where if you didn't say a white lie to your parents or to older siblings, you would get beat up or lose your food or whatever. There'd be instant danger. So in the past, yes, your moral principle is saying, if I say white lies or nuance the truth to soothe everybody's feelings and the angry baby's feeling of all the raging people, their safety, that worked. 
Yeah. It's not even a lie. It's like sometimes there's so much shit. No one wants to hear it. It's bad and it's ugly and it's, it's like really, really, really bad. <laughs> and it's embarrassing telling people like they don't need to know, but that's such a big part of you. But it's like, God, you don't want to tell anybody. It's so fucked up. It's so like, <laughs> you know, well, you how do you do? Tell other people the truth. Right now, it's mostly not yourself. lying to yourself. Got it. Got it. Then later on, you have to Got navigate it. social interactions. Some people don't want to hear your opinion. <laughs> so Got even it. though you see it's a train wreck, if there's not an opening from their side, there's no need for you to, Got it. Yeah. to share that. But if you're starting to lie to yourself, are you still lying to yourself about certain things? Or you're shutting off parts of yourself and not allowing that part to catch up to reality. Then it just keeps the old programs going. Now there's another cell. If you start living the truth, there's another benefit. So this is, Peterson covers this pretty well and that's sort of part of the noble aim so part of my pitch is trying to say if you give your more morality brain higher principles more noble aims then everything starts working out because now your morality has a bigger goal has a bigger structure and you if you have a bigger goal then you have you're less uh, vulnerable to narcissists and borderlines because you're, you, they can't trigger your guilt. Because you're living at a higher standard than them. Most of your viewers will have watched Pinocchio. <laughs> Probably. So there's a scene in Pinocchio where Geppetto wishes on a star. Right? And what it means is he lifts up his eyes beyond the horizon to something transcendent, to something ultimate, because that's what a star is. It's, it's part of the, of the eternity of the night sky. And so he lifts his eyes up above his daily concerns and he says, what I want what, what I want more than anything else is that my creation will become a genuine individual. Right? It's, it's a heroic gesture because it's so unlikely. And that catalyzes the puppet's transformation into a real being. And we start as puppets. And so the trick is to get rid of your goddamn strings. And you remember in Pinocchio, he faces a lot of temptations. One is to be a liar. The other is to be a neurotic victim. That's how he ends up in Pleasure Island, where he just about gets sold into the salt mines. Well, okay, so what you do is you lift up your eyes and you say, look, I would like being to progress in the best possible manner. And that's best for me best for my family, best for society, maybe best for the world, then you tell the truth. And then you can tell if you're telling the truth. You can tell it physiologically. You watch what you say, and you will find out that some things you say make you come apart. They make you fall apart. They, and you can feel it. It's physiologically. It's centered, in your, it's centered in your solar plexus. It's a feeling of chaotic weakness and dissolution. It's, it's a sense of self-betrayal. And then if you tell the truth, that pulls you together and strengthens you. And so you can learn to feel when your words are accurately articulating yourself. And then you practice that. And that makes you into the sort of person that won't be an Auschwitz guard, that won't play ideological games, that won't sacrifice other people to their expediency. So one benefit of raising the value of speaking the truth is that you can feel, or for Peterson in this angle, that your inner core, if you lie or you betray yourself, you feel this weakness within. But at the same time, if you tell the truth, you feel this inner strength, this sort of congruence, this solidity, because now you're starting to speak from your truth. And when you speak from your truth, you're more grounded. You have natural boundaries. You have more gravity. So if I was like a narcissist, I wanted to uh, knock you off balance. I would try to limit your capacity to share your inner truth 
or whenever you said something that was inner truth, I could hit you or I would punish you. So that your, your, your brain would say, if I share truth, it's dangerous. And I'll start self-silencing myself. Therefore, I need to find somebody else to tell me what's true. There is a mechanism within your soul and your spirit when you speak the truth that you feel stronger. There's one more thing that's in the way. So part of the thing that's in the way is psychology is obsessed about self-esteem. And it's kicked in maybe since the 80s or 90s where we give people compliments to make them feel good, to raise their self-esteem. But if you raise your self-esteem based on somebody else telling you stuff, you, that's not self-esteem, that's other esteem. Somebody else's esteem of you <laughs> makes you feel good. You aren't evaluating yourself based on your own self-judgment of saying, I'm pretty good. You're relying on somebody else to say, you're great, you're pretty, whatever. So slowly you develop an external locus of control because you're, you're just feeding off other people's compliments. Psychologists have been, not all psychologists obviously, but the psychological profession is, is neck deep in this, in this pathology, has been beating the self-esteem drum for 50 years. Oh no, you're okay, you should feel good about yourself. Like, you're, you're fine the way you are. It's like you think, well that's a calming message for people. It's like, no it's not. It's not at all. And I, I watch my audiences, it's like, it's full of people in the audience who think, I'm suffering a lot more than I think is tenable. A whole bunch of it's my fault. My life is not in the order it should be. I know I'm doing 50 things wrong. It's like, what the hell's wrong with me? What's wrong with the people around me? This is really serious. And some, you know, well-meaning person comes up and says, you know, you're okay just the way you are. It's like, no one wants that message. It's like, no, I'm not okay the way I am. I'm not okay at all the way I am. I know that. And so, you know, when I'm, when I'm speaking, to, to, when I'm speaking now, I say to people, well, well, you're nowhere near what you could be. That's the, that's the positive message. It's like, yeah, you're a mess, but you don't have to stay that way. If you're a mess, you know it, obviously, you're suffering away, like, like so much you can barely tolerate it. It's like, that's okay. You could do something about it. And so you that's gotta, the thing that, that turns the lights on. It's like, you yeah. could do something about it. You yeah. could do something about it. You yeah. could do something about it. So a lot of self-esteem talk is actually uh, extinguishing your your morality center, your judgment center. It's like uh, sugar, giving you sugar, the results of attaining whatever goal, but not giving you any of the mastery or the life experience. Yeah, I mean, that would go under like the positive or the toxic positivity where you're just saying like, everything's fine, everything's great all the time, but you still feel terrible. And even within the therapeutic process, saying that people are okay when they're mentally and emotionally not okay is also invalidating and you don't really you know for yourself that something is off but people don't either understand it or they you can't really express it to them so it becomes again about um releasing the victim mentality and like getting back to the ownership process of like i know how i feel i know what i'm experiencing if you go to a therapist, like, I need the tools to get out of this particular situation, but I know that I'm feeling something about it here. But that's me just kind of like rambling. No, you're not just rambling, you're finding words. And when you say the words that fit for you, or as you get to the words, you, your inner sensations start feeling, feeling out which words fit right, feel right. But if you didn't grow up with reflectors or uh, neutral, neutral witnesses that let you talk out your ideas to find the truth, to find what feels right, to think out your thoughts by talking them out, then you don't know. That's fair. Because, yeah, if you're in a room with a bunch of codependents and then you start having a flashback and you start venting or talking out your flashback and you're trying to talk it out to make sense of it. But if somebody jumps in and gives you a summary for you or give you five steps on how to get out of it, they're not letting you, you finish talking out your story to make sense of it or at least get a little bit more 
understanding of it. So it's tricky to find a therapist that is able to stay neutral and not uh, jump in and rescue prematurely. Uh, okay, so how about this for an idea? I made an argument that part of this pitch is to give your, mor your morality principle, your superego, a goal, a greater goal. So those ideals are going to be unique to each and every one of you. So here's a Mentimeter. Anything you admire or any like these role models and then what other traits you admire of these. But this is also how your unconscious or subconscious is projecting these desires. So honesty is one of the bigger ones. So if you own these values, pick and choose what resonates with you. Write it on a post-it, write it on your bed, or repeat this as a core value. And then aspire to live that principle, not to enforce other people for it. Just can you own the principle of honesty? How can you be more honest? How can you be more kind? How can you persevere more? Set a goal, set an intention, put it on a vision board, whatever, however you want to plant the intention. And then that's a noble aim, customized to you. Yes. And then that's sort of a homework. Try it out, set a goal, noble aim, one or two, three values, and just try to integrate that into your lifestyle see what happens. Or you could have a conversation with your different parts and see what's the root cause? What's the, what, how's my life not manifesting whatever your inner voice is trying to warn you about or yell at you after whatever's happening. 